All right, so welcome to How Goods Innovation Online Series. I'm Ethan Soloviev, Chief Innovation Officer. Today, we have a really exciting panel conversation uh, on product innovation ecosystems uh, with Heather Cutter from Harmless Harvest, Diego Rosso from Danone, and Regina Lefecta from Happy Family Organics. Uh, here's a little outline of uh, how things will go today. Uh, there's going to be these brief introductions and then we'll launch right into a conversation with these thought leaders for about 30, 35 minutes. Then there'll be a point where we do some little interactive community breakouts. So you'll get to go in a room with some of the other great people who are on the call, connect, say hello, and then generate some ideas and questions for the panel. And then we'll come back together uh, and you can type in the chat or even potentially uh, come off mute and ask a question. Um, just one note before we get started, we have some upcoming events in this series. So How Goods Innovation Online series has been running since just a little bit after Expo West last year, after Expo West didn't happen last year. Uh, and so uh, this is sort of the third iteration and we're really focusing on product design, product innovation, product formulation. Uh, and so after this talk today, upcoming, uh, we have a chef's perspective with two amazing chefs, Fabricio uh, Goulart from Feitosa Food Tech and Pierre Tiam from Yolele. Uh, we're going to be speaking about reimagining resilient ingredients. Uh, Fabricio's in Brazil. Uh, Pierre Tiam has uh, connections to his homeland of Senegal and are both making really amazing uh, regenerative, resilient food products from their chef's background, but then selling them, you know, in a CPG context. So that's going to be amazing. Uh, and then Ali Buzari, who works at Pilot R&D, a really top-notch sort of boutique uh, R&D, doing very, you know, interesting product design and development. Um, we'll talk about building sustainable products from the ground up. So uh, we hope you'll join us for those and invite other folks as well. And without any further ado, let's dive in. Welcome, Heather, Diego, and Regina. I'm so glad you could make it. Um, and maybe we could just start off, uh, not so much with like a full introduction, but more by way of um, who are you and what's an exciting product that you have worked on uh, recently or in the past, just like some product you've designed, innovated, developed that you wanna sort of introduce yourself through that product. Let's go Diego and then Heather and then Regina. Sure, um, thanks Ethan, first of all for, for the night. Um, so, so my name is Diego Ross, think if, if I think of a product that has been really exciting uh, to work on uh, in the past couple of months, um, it's probably our so delicious, very free uh, plant-based cheese. So we have shreds and slices. And, and I work as, as the plant-based uh, COE manager or center of excellence manager here in Danone, uh, North America. And cheese is like one of the things that people, when, when trying to convert to a plant-based diet, it's like the last frontier, right? And, and, and having been able to work on something that delivers that type of taste uh, uh, and experience is probably one product that I would say it's, it's that one. That's the, the exciting one for sure. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm Heather Cutter. Uh, I, I run the revenue side of the business at Harmless Harvest, but I am an innovator by training uh, in, in my three very disparate title uh, words. Innovation is actually the strongest one, so really happy to be here. Um, I think uh, probably for me, it's our yogurt. Uh, and, and there's a few reasons. Um, one, you know, from a, uh, a product development standpoint, um, we, we had, uh, we embarked on a zero waste uh, coconut initiative um, about 18 months ago. I don't times all discombobulated with the pandemic, but you know we we are, are very well known for our coconut water, um, and we um, buy and harvest many many coconuts. Uh, and previously, we um, would extract the coconut water, and then for the majority of the coconuts, the rest of them would either be sold in uh, in Thailand or go to the landfill. So you know this product. Um, was kind of a, a fun one because we were finding a new use for something that was previously thrown away. Um, and it turns out it was a really amazing product. So um, it's, a, it's a product development pro project that you can feel good about. Um, and we were able to make a really great product. And what is it made of? What was being thrown away that you now get to make the yogurt out of? Yeah, so we, we take the water out of the coconuts the same way we always did. 
Um, and then we, we actually hand scoop the, the meat from our Nam Hong coconuts, which is a little bit different than the coconuts that probably most of you are used to, which is kind of that hard uh, fibrous meat, you know, with the brown furry skin. Um, our coconuts are the green ones. And so the inside meat is more like a, a gelatinous um, kind of creamy texture. And uh, it, makes, it makes a very dairy-like yogurt. Amazing, thank you. Welcome, Regina. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Regina Fector, and I am the VP of Innovation um, and E-commerce, something that I, I took on over the last year um, as well, and actually fits in really, really nicely with innovation and our marketing um, team. Um, and a shout out, I know some of the, the members of the Happy Family team are on this call too. Um, and for those of you that don't know us as well, we're the largest organic baby food brand and the number two baby food brand after Gerber. Um, despite only being 15 years old. So we're a bit of a teenager in the set. Um, but I, so one of, one of my um, sort of proudest moment innovations over the last couple of years is our line um, of baby food purees called Nutty Blends, which is really meant to be a um, allergen introduction and sort of allergen maintenance line for babies in a baby appropriate um, puree. Um, so you take, you know, a banana and we add, um, one gram of peanut protein um, through peanut butter or almond, walnut, um, or cashew. And I think for us, it was, you know, the, the two key stats that are really alarming. And for any parents on the call, 8% of children today have um, allergies. And I think nut allergies are extremely scary. Um, our CEO has two children with nut allergies. And so that sort of brought it really close to home. Um, and then 50% of parents today are really like freaked out when it comes to how do you introduce to a six month old, they can't even really swallow peanut butters, you know, getting things on their hands can be an allergen concern for other kids. So um, we launched this line with these extremely strong insights. We partnered with the um, scientific affairs team with outside KOLs and um, we, this is one of our most successful product lines this year. Um, and it's sort of, you know, gone past our, our retail expectations um, and has been a success with Target, who is our key, our key retail partner as well. So. Excellent. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear. And I think this will come up more, but um, uh, the, the connection between you as innovators and your customers and what does that interplay and connection and back and forth look like in order for you to be listening to them, but also staying, uh, staying ahead of them. Um, and so I think my next question sort of starts to walk us in that direction, which is, and this is for any of you to start, um, but how do you think about innovation and product innovation that might be different from other people? Um, yeah, wh what is it about innovation to you and like, how, how is that different? But then also how do you, not you just do it for yourself, but how do you make that work for a team? So let's start with Regina and then we'll uh, go from there. Sure. So um, I would say for us at Happy Family, we are a core mission driven brand. So our mission is to change the, tra the trajectory of children's health through nutrition, um, which is really inspirational. I think brings a lot of us to work and, and keeps us wanting to work at Happy. Um, but it really gives the scope for innovation a, a bit broader. So <clears throat> I like to say we're not, we don't think about just being a baby, <clears throat> excuse me, just being a baby food company we're providing solutions to parents to help solve nutrition and create health for their families and for their children. So of course, snacks and meals for babies and toddlers are the core of that, but our marketing team, how we provide content, um, we have free registered dietitian support on our website that anybody can, um, can access. We think about shopping, e-commerce, you know, how are parents today? And we have so many different touch points with consumers, like you're saying, a lot of us are consumer, which is really in one point helpful, but then of course you've got to get out of your own head and your own sort of narrow minded approach. Um, and then I would say we as a business also are very, we're a bit of a smaller team. So we're about 110 employees. What is pretty incredible is that last year during COVID, the silver line, lining of being remote is that we had even more people participate in, in our innovation cycle. So as a team, Innovation is like one of the key pillars of our company, doesn't matter what department you're in. So of course, you know, myself within marketing, our r &I team, but also our ops team is very much like an innovation driven, innovation sort of inspired team. 
Um, and a bit of that comes from top down from our COO, but I think it comes from just attracting people and talent that are inspired by that. Um, and so 50, 50% 50 of our overall company participated in the like brainstorming cycle last year, which was up from probably more like 25% when we used to have in-person brainstorming meetings. Um, and I think also people really recognize that for us, innovation um, drives so much growth. So like for, for us last year, 91% of our net sales growth was driven by innovation that had launched either last year or the year prior. Um, and so it has to be the priority for all of our team because we all know it sort of makes or breaks our set in all, all of our key retail partners. Fascinating. Yeah, it's really cool to hear there. Uh, this the title of this talk around innovation ecosystems. You're sort of bringing that not just out beyond to the customers, but even within the whole team. So it, it becomes a more woven net that is feeding into the ideas of innovation, which, as you pointed to, are so important for business success. Heather, Diego, either you want to jump in and add sort of your perspective on, yeah, how you think about innovation, how you make that work for a team. Yeah, yeah definitely. Oh, go ahead, Diego. Oh, go, go. So. From from my standpoint, if I get it from the lens of, of plan based and what we're doing here in Danone with the plan based center of excellence, we have a network of, of, of experts just globally, right? And and when we start with innovation, you know, I, I, we do think about local first, and we start thinking about who the consumer is going to be and what is the solution this product is, is bringing to the market, and it starts with that. But to make it work for 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 the team, I think it it helps to have other people's perspective, um, specifically for, from my lens, technically from an R&D standpoint, to be able to see what those tools and, and technology enablers might be, be it ingredient processing, that maybe we don't see because we're too focused in, in, th in this geographical location, we got to see what the world is doing. And so that's what, what I would say helps to make it work is, is to think outside of the box, think outside of your global location as well. Excellent, thank you. Heather? Um, yeah, I mean, similar to re what Regina said, we're also mission-based. Um, and for us, um, it, we're all about um, creating an ecosystem around the coconut. So we wanna make remarkable products that create a natural demand for, um, for, for our coconut products so that we can um, support the, the farming community um, within Thailand. And there's a lot more to it than that, but it really starts with, I think what's unique to Harmless Harvest is if you make amazing products that taste great, then people want to buy them. You know, without that, then you, you don't create enough scale. And we do have, we, we are a huge market mover in, in Thailand for the type of coconut we buy. Um, so our innovation, like how we approach innovation, you know, besides the obvious, you know, what do consumers want and need, um, right now is very much around using that coconut. Um, and that's both for for beverages, so like our coconut water, additional functional beverages, how can we utilize more, more coconuts? Um, but also as we've entered into plant-based dairy um, and you know, always with kind of two pillars in mind that are specific to harmless harvest, one being taste. Um, we, we make, maybe biased, but the most amazing tasting coconut water, um, which is awesome, but it's a, it sets a high bar for everything else we do. Um, and if we stray too far from that, um, you know, get overly functional, but it doesn't taste great. Like it's just not really on brand for us. We're a taste forward brand. Um, and then the second one is craft. So, um, you know, and, and that's sort of loosely used. We are a, 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 food, a, a food company, but, you know, we have a craft process for how we make our coconut water. Um, we have, it's proprietary and um, we do it differently than anyone else. And so we really try as we look at other innovations to say like, what is that process differentiator um, you know, for us on the yogurt, it's, it's scooping meat and, and starting from that meat. Um, and we really try to apply that same craft process uh, in everything that we do. Thank you. That's amazing. So I'm thinking about the product innovation ecosystems that, that you are each speaking to in your own way. And then also something I didn't sort of call out at the front end here is that each of you work uh, in some way, shape or form in the larger Danone ecosystem. So Diego directly for Danone, Regina through Happy Family, part of the Danone family. Harmless Harvest is connected to Danone through Danone Manifesto Ventures. And so I'm curious to what extent you are looking at and seeing each other's work, the innovation processes that, that you use, is it just within the Danone family or where else do you sort of look 
in the wider product innovation ecosystem for your inspiration, for your new directions, ideas, again, whether that's on ingredients or you know, manufacturing processes or something else. Actually, uh, I, I can go first since I oh, will. Great. Um, so uh, we're probably the most kind of the most outside the bubble um, because uh, we work, uh, we're connected through um, Danone through a minority investment at the moment. Um, but that said, you know, we are fortunate to get some access to uh, help as needed. And we, we have um, specifically when we uh, when we worked on the yogurt. Uh, who better to uh, to work on that with than Danone? Uh, they certainly know what they're doing. So you know we have um, more at arm's length uh, worked together uh, and collaborated. Um, you know I think as time goes on we'll see how that relationship deepens. But we don't share um, our business uh, information yet. Yeah, and I think from 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 our end. Um, have, have, at least from mine, from a plant-based standpoint, and you know, working on brands like Silk and Silk is dairy free. Uh, we are looking at you know what what Happy Family, Harmless Harvest are doing, just from an inspiration standpoint, and seeing what they're doing as far as ingredient selection, and that helps you know inspire us here in the U.S. but also globally. So there's a lot of uh, global counterparts from mine, for example, in Latin America, that look at coconut. And what it could be, and so they look at the products that you know Heather and, their and, and her team works on, as well as Happy Family and her team. And so we end up looking at them. And, and, and with Happy Family, we're a little bit closer, and I think we're just starting to, to share more and more about um, you know technologies and what can enable each other. Regina, anything you would add? I would I would say exactly, and maybe to to put a fine point on it, the three of us hadn't met prior to right before everybody joined the call. So I think I mean I think it's exciting. I think a lot of people probably that are listening are part of the innovation cycle in some way. I know you know a couple members of of my team, Marku who leads packaging, Katie who leads sustainability, are plugged into um, you know the different sort of functional expertise areas. I would say we need to all be so connected on all of our sustainability pillars. I mean, I think we, I think we are, but even even more so, um, I know there are a couple of questions around flexible film, which we can also, we can get to, that's a sort of very important hot topic. Um, but we, yeah, we take inspiration, I would say from from everywhere and we need to continue to draw on, I think the, the Danone connections more. Great. So let, yeah, let's go to packaging for a minute. There's a whole huge number of topics in sustainability that we would love to touch on, but let's let's go to packaging for a bit. There's a couple of questions from the audience about, you know, how do you think about it in what was asked was a sustainable way. I'll up the ante and say, is there such a thing as regenerative packaging? And how would you think about, you know, a coconut itself? That's that's a nice, that's regenerative packaging there potentially. But so how do you think about packaging for CPG products in a sustainable, in a regenerative way? Um, if you want to touch films, Regina, or yeah, let's let's go a little bit here and then and then move back to towards sort of ingredients. Yeah, so I can, I mean, I can start off a bit and then I will let Marku chat if I'm saying anything wrong. Um, yes, she just said she's on. Um, so I think we at Happy Family think about our sustainability strategy um, in three major pillars. So sort of reducing climate impact, generally speaking, which is sort of like the holistic um, commitment and sort of we're, we're, we're going towards what is our big commitment around, you know, carbon positive, like in that direction. Um, which are obviously Horizon has made. Um, implementing regenerative agriculture is a huge, a huge one for us as well. And we launched a product line last year around that and with regeneratively grown fruits and vegetables and grains. Um, and then improving packaging sustainability is that third big pillar. And frankly, that's what we get most questions from parents because it feels bad when you realize that a pouch, which is the, the vast majority of our products that we sell, in the flexible film, I think a lot of moms think they are recyclable, um, perhaps. And then when you realize they're not, you feel really guilty about that. And that's one of the big questions that we get. And it's also what we need to be focused on, you know, as the core of our business. And so Marku and team is, is really focused on um, what we can do to create a recycle ready um, mono material pouch. And there's a lot of headway being done both in the US and then in the EU. Um, two different approaches. U.S. is more of a PE. EU is more of a P. I believe it's a PP. 
um, version. Um, I think the, the key issue in the US is the infrastructure that exists in each of the 50 states, which is not coordinated, makes it extremely difficult to go from recycle ready. And it's also very confusing because some people talk about recyclable if they partner with TerraCycle, which is actually not recyclable. Again, it's, it's this is sort of like mincing words for almost like a greenwashing story, which I think we all need to be so ethical about because it's really confusing to parents um, versus truly having that um, recyclable, you know, curbside. Um, but then also the chemical recycling, I think component is another piece that comes into it and, and what part of a solution could that be? Um, and so I think, yeah, we are committed though. We, as a brand two years ago, made the commitment to be part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, circular plastics economy. So by 2025, all of our packaging needs to be re reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And it is a daunting challenge that we are, and I will say every single new product that we launch that is the question, is the package sustainable? What are we gonna do? When is it gonna be brought on for our commitments? It is like the constant narrative, um, but sometimes it's more expensive. So it's this back and forth of, you know, how do you implement it? When do you implement it? And then the infrastructure. Excellent, thank you. Heather, do you wanna add anything there? Yeah, um, you know, similarly, our sustainability programs are pretty wide. Um, we have a huge regenerative agriculture um, project going that I'm sure we'll get to in one of these questions, but specific to the packaging, um, it's similar uh, to what Regina said, you know, our plastic bottles uh, for our coconut water are one of the number one complaints that we get. Um, it's been interesting as a side note to see that change during the pandemic. I found it really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, you know, we did, um, so, and, and the other thing I should mention is our microfiltration process that we use for coconut water, the only viable packaging option for us right now is plastic. And so with that in mind, and that's really the core of our business, like we've really been working hard on uh, post-consumer recycled. Um, it's important to us that we're not using virgin materials. We moved to 30% RPET um, last year, which we felt like was a baby step, honestly, um, but we have a path and we'll be moving to 100% RPET this year which is a giant step forward for us. Um, and that will cover you know, all of our packaging um, for beverage, which is the, the vast majority of our business. Um, and then similar to what Regina said, you know, we have a commitment to having post-consumer recycled materials in all of our packaging by 2025, but you know, that would be things like yogurt and, and uh, non-beverage products that we're not gonna drink this year. Excellent. Oh, sorry, one other thing that's kind of fun and not really like a big, uh, part of our business, but you said it, so I, I figured I'd share. We do actually, um, uh, as a, one of the, we have a byproducts business, mostly where we sell byproducts uh, in Asia. And one of the items that we sell is we actually make a bowl out of our coconut husks. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's pretty cool to watch. It's like, after we, we've scooped out the meat, um, some percentage of our coconuts go to the side and we actually kind of carve them into a bowl, which we sell to a Korean ice cream company who actually sells coconut ice cream that's in the bowl. Amazing. So, I want to get of, one of those bowls. I know. I really want kitchen. to do something with it here, but uh, we haven't gotten that far. You should sell an like idea. a collectible line or like run a little contest. I'd love to get one. Um, yeah, they're pretty neat. Diego, anything you want to add here on the packaging? Um, I mean, outside of just saying that sounds so cool, I want to. I want one of those bowls. Um, <laughs> You know, in that same line, you know, we've we we have made commitments, um, you know, for the future on uh, pack circularity, uh, regenerative, regenerative packaging, um, and we have a, a broad just regenerative ag agriculture uh, agenda. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I'm very close to to the product design piece of things, and 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 just tying it down to how we can make new packaging. We're always looking at how to take waste streams. And see if that may be something to to, to help uh, create new types of packaging, right? And so you, you close that loop. So that's also something that we're we're continuously looking at, and it becomes very interesting and very complex just from a global standpoint uh, because you start making different products, different you know, in different ways. So the 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 output tends to be different, and so it, it just it turns out to be a very interesting, complex, uh, but at the same time very exciting. Uh, way to think about packaging. 
Yeah. I'll just make a few notes on packaging here from how good's perspective. So um, one packaging is really big in the minds of consumers, right? Each of you have spoken to this and uh, because here I am, I'm left with that pouch for after my daughter has it, I'm left with, you know, that bottle after I, after I drink it. So what do I do with this? I feel the guilt. It's in my hand here. And at the same time, if you look at the climate impact, if you look at the biodiversity impact, the packaging is actually a very small portion relative to the impact of the ingredients that go into it. Uh, it's usually somewhere to between two to 7% of the overall carbon footprint, water footprint. It's, it's just not as big or important as the ingredients itself. Um, how good has been building in our um, sustainability impact software, we've been building a packaging module that will address some of this. And then I think all the thinking, each of you spoke to it really well, but about regenerative packaging and what would that mean? What would that look like? I think is a really exciting realm to explore. And there was another one of these innovation series from earlier last year that you can listen to. Uh, that's Jane Franch from New Me Tea, who's doing some really cool stuff with uh, flexible films, compostable uh, flexible films that I think is is just yeah really great so that's you're all welcome to go and, and watch that on the innovation series site but let's go back let's we touched regenerative a bit so let's dig in on on regenerative agriculture but also not just that the agriculture itself is important useful I'd love to hear a bit about what each of you are sort of thinking how you're seeking to integrate that into your products um, but then even to take it a little bit beyond of like what does it mean to be regenerative not just about how you grow the ingredient, but about even how you do innovation, how you're sort of regenerating your product lines, regenerating your engagement with your customers. So yeah, either way you want to take that to talk a bit about regenerative agriculture or more about sort of regeneration in, in terms of product, I think would be exciting. Let's go Heather, Diego, Regina this time. I could probably talk for the rest of the time, but I won't do that. Um, so yeah, we, we um, coconuts are a mono, a mono culture crop. Um, so that is, you know, and that is what we make our product out of, you know, primarily. So um, we've embarked on a pretty big project um, to transition to regenerative organic farming. We've got several pilot farms um, in action already. Um, and it's super important. I mean, last year we had the biggest drought in Thailand in 30 years. Um, and with uh, soil that's not healthy, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, a risk on our business. Uh, we have to make sure that we have um, coconuts that can withstand a drought. And so, you know, as, as much as we obviously want to do good in the world, it's also really important for our business. Um, and so part of that, probably the biggest part of it for us is um, intercropping and planting cover crops. Um, so, you know, when you go to the, the coconut groves, which many of us have, um, you know, it's basically uh, the, the trees are in, in, in rows in between canals um, because of our coconuts are really delicate. So you pick the coconuts off the tree and then fall into the water. Um, but if that soil is not healthy, um, it's constantly eroding um, and it doesn't absorb the moisture. So we, um, as when you go to a farm that's, that's got the proper intercropping and it, you know, where we've introduced biodiversity, you see um, kind of green cover um, all over and then the soil is, is is much different looking. Um, so what's been really cool as we've experimented um, with how we're gonna do this is what are the crops and what are, what are the things that we're gonna put in? Um, and from an innovation standpoint, we're collaborating heavily. We do have a whole team on the ground in Thailand. We do our own manufacturing um, and we have a whole sourcing team. So, you know, we're very much joined at the hip with them. We're, we're talking about things like, what are the things we're gonna plant and how can we use it in our innovation to really make it come full circle. So. You know, some of the things that we're looking at are um, we've got bees on those uh, in those farms now because that's um, obviously helping. Um, and what can we do with the honey that we uh, we get from those bees? We're doing uh, we're planting additional fruits. So you know, what other tropical fruits can we blend in? Um, spices. We've even looked at coffee. So um, all of these things are um, both um, ingredients that we can use in our innovation, but also uh, additional income source for our farmers. Um, so it is true, you know, sort of a true circular uh, benefit um, for everyone involved. And what a source of, yeah, innovation. Um, yeah, to, it, to, fun. It, like innovating from the, the crop ecosystem itself of like what else grows with coconuts. Very exciting. Yeah, Diego, love to hear from you. Yeah, uh, I think I'll take it from a product design uh, lens. Um, yeah. You know, the work that, that we do, that I do, that my team does is 
is essentially based on formulation and process design. And so we're, we're, we're making decisions on what comes into that innovation. And, you know, I think long gone are the days that we didn't think more towards what's actually coming in and how does decision, those decisions impact, uh, you know, just the environment. And so we're now getting closer and starting to become more data driven and working with our, uh, you know, our procurement teams, our sourcing teams to really understand if we as a product developer say we need to use this type of oil or this type of, of, of soy or almond, whatever it might be, you know, there, there are impacts to that. And, and so working and talking about ecosystems, right? Working with, with uh, companies that are data driven and are taking all that data like you guys are and, and how good, you know, that helps us make a better decision when it comes to innovating and designing around uh, just responsible sourcing. Um, and that takes us all the way down to regenerative, I can never say that word, uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, so, so, you know, to, to summarize just this thought, I think as product developers and as designers, the more data we can get uh, and the more we can think about those ingredients coming in and those selections, you know, the better we're going to be when it comes to actually innovating responsibly, but also innovating in a way that is regenerative. Love it. Yeah, thank you. Regina. Yeah, and I'll just echo that we also, you know, using the How Good tool, I think that's one of the data-driven ways that we're looking at overall, you know, impact of all of our different ingredients. And so I think we need, like, you need to have a baseline and, and a set of metrics to be able to really measure that. Um, and, um, but I think, so yeah, I love, love the, the different stories. I, um, the story of us for regenerative really started in 2017 um, with um, Katie, our director of sustainability doing a, we used to call it a project greenhouse. Um, and it was like a smaller pilot. And I think this is another thing that we at Happy Family, when there's sort of passion for a project, we often will start small as some sort of a pilot. Um, and then, you know, see where it takes off from there. And obviously I think Expo West two years ago, people that were there, there was just the, the regenerative, the sort of um, the passion around rock and, you know, Patagonia coming forward. I think it was all sort of all like uh, it, within the natural and organic food space, there was definitely a lot of buzz there. And, and for us, we basically were saying, what do we have to do to create, you know, to number one, support farmers, um, and, and see if our farming partners want to, who are already doing organic farming, what do they need to do to really, you know, improve the biodiversity and improve soil health and ultimately set that baseline? Um, because not everybody necessarily wanted to opt in to, to sort of strive to that next level. Um, and how did we, we wanted to ultimately launch a product line, which we did in um, four packs of purees last, last year. Um, extending them into singles this year. And we, one of the, I think the challenges that we have had is how do you market? So to an organic consumer that assumes that organic is already better for the world and the environment um, and, and biodiversity, and it is because without the toxic persistent pesticides um, and you know, generally having a little bit less mo mono culture with organic, though there is still, you know, big organic absolutely still has that problem. Um, people are confused. And so we launched a line that we call Farmed for Our Future, which resonates more with a lot of consumers, but it's been an interesting journey for us because I think it's still so much the cutting edge. I think for everybody on this call, you know, it's, it's just exciting. People understand it. People are willing to pay more for it, you know, but when you look in mass retail, um, we found actually people don't want to pay more for regenerative. People want to do good and pay the same and sort of not have that onus put on them. And so I think that's an important lesson for us as well. Sort of how do, how do we bring our consumers along as part of the journey? Yeah. Heather, I saw you shaking your head there. Anything you want to add on that? That last little bit there is very juicy. Uh, no, I mean, I think the, the organic uh, to regenerative uh, you know, sort of step forward is we've been watching the Happy Family launch um, on the side because it's been interesting to us and just trying to see, and there are a few other brands that have now started to, you know, put that on the packaging and talk about it. Um, and we're not quite there yet, but we're really thinking about like, 
you know, how do you message this in a way that makes sense? And how do you uh, get people to care about it? And we, we do realize that we're in this bubble that all of us on this call are on. Um, and it's, it's coming and people will get it, but, you know, we're going to be on the forefront along with um, some of these other brands of really educating consumers. Right. Yeah. And does that translate right away to increase sales or is there a lag that then actually picks up a lot and you wanted to be on it earlier? But yeah, it's a very interesting question. I want to do one more question from the audience here before we go into these little breakouts. There's one here um, from Mike that says product design is key. What metrics, what sustainability metrics tend to matter most? And is that really coming from, from you, from inside the company? Or are retailers pushing for certain things? How do you sort of balance between that in terms of which metrics you're, you're tracking and paying attention to as you're working on uh, product design? Let's go different order. Let's go Heather and then Regina and Diego wrap us up. So metrics around sustainability or around uh, Innovation in general. Sorry. Yeah, more. I think the question is more on sustainability and sort of if retailers are asking for those or you're choosing them. Yeah, I mean, every retailer is different. Um, so, you know, the obvious ones uh, who are leading the charge, uh, you get you get points and check marks for, for doing uh, for doing the right thing. And then, you know, as, as I think Regina said, like, you know, maybe a more mass re retailer, they're not there yet. Um, so, you know, I think everyone's kind of on a spectrum. Um, we have our own internal framework and roadmap that we're working towards. Um, and that's the lens that we're looking through. I, we're holding ourselves to a high standard, um, you know, across kind of three areas, um, uh, you know, around using resources responsibly, being transparent. And I should know the third one off the top of my head since I helped write it, um, but I'm blanking. Um, but you know we have a set of metrics against it, and I think for us, self-measuring is the is the best thing that um, that we the, the thing that we feel the strong the strongest about. Um, and there are a few key retailers who I think are great uh, thought leaders and partners who we certainly gut check with, um, and uh, and and that's sort of how we're how we're uh, managing it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, Regina, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I think one of um, an interesting example for us recently was with Target, who is you know so important in the U.S. Um, as a mass and also has become such an important e-com retailer. And I would say our buyer is very passionate about you know making improvements around sustainability and sort of being part of that, but but certainly doesn't come to us with metrics. So I think we we have helped to share you know these are this is what we signed on as part of the Ellen MacArthur. Um, circular plastics economy and really sort of helping to, you know, it's interesting. We haven't tried to get her to push other baby food brands. I think that's another thing that you sometimes see is um, what does the standard become? And then everybody in the aisle sort of needs to aspire to get there. But I think what did happen was then she wanted to connect her internal sustainability team and specifically package it, packaging team with our team. And there was sort of a separate call there. So I think to me, it's, that's good, but it's also a little unfortunate that it almost becomes a bit of a siloed thing mm -hmm. of, you know, it's still a piece of the what your innovation should bring, but it's still sort of on the side as well. Like, let's have the sustainability folks talk to the sustainability folks. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I do think also organic baby food in Target is now like 65% of the aisle. It's incredible. Like, it's like the leading edge of the organic industry is baby food. Um, at a place that's mass like Target. And so that those consumers care even more about sustainability. And so, but we, that, that aisle is the pouch, which is the flexible film problem that we're talking about. So I think that's the piece that um, in our category, a lot of, mm. you know, retailers are, they know about, but there's not an immediate solution. So that's also what makes it difficult. Fascinating, thank you. Diego, your, your thoughts on this metrics, sustainability? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to build on what Regina said about this this um, phenomenon for the lack of a better word of of siloing, right? And and keeping yeah. mm -hmm. the sustainability talk um, aside, uh, we're trying to break those uh, and break that wall from a product design standpoint. Um, as you know, Ethan, we have a great group of product developers that are are trying to bring in just th these sustainability metrics which sometimes come from, you know, working directly with the retailers. Some retailers do have an idea and already have set forth what, what their preferred, uh, you know, metrics are, but also us internally within the known, we've talked about what those should be. And they, at the end of the day, can be product specific as well, right? Um, and so we're trying to, 
as we design and we design with like our marketing teams, our uh, manufacturing teams to make sure that it is part of the conversation starting from zero. Because if, if you start early on, then these metrics, be it you know, already set forth by, by the retailer or if we're trying to, to make it our, our own because of the internal decisions, then it becomes easier um, to make it part of, of the design at the end of the day. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. I love all your perspectives. And also thinking, you know, that point about the different product categories, different of these metrics are going to you know, be more or less important packaging more. And some we're seeing from how good's perspective, looking at millions of products in the market, that the ones that are all keep popping up over and over and over again, metrics are around carbon, metrics are around water. Uh, and then biodiversity is one that's coming in. If you have animal products, and I'd love to get to some plant-based conversation in a little bit, then, but if you have animal-based products and animal welfare comes up. Uh, and then another one that is a little harder to talk about because it's hard to make exciting, positive claims around is around economics, whether that's farmer livelihoods, uh, whether that's labor risk and working conditions. Those are some of the main ones that we hear both from the retail side uh, and you know coming internally from the brand side. Um, okay. I yeah, actually just want to add that just sparked something for me. So um, Amazon rolled out, I think a couple of months ago, uh, the Climate Pledge, um, which is an icon that is like right under your product headline. Um, and there are, call it 15 different ways that you can apply for this. Interestingly, our team's reviewing them all. We're not currently eligible for any of them because of various is things. I think if you're a paper product that's sold in recyclable cardboard, you can be. Otherwise it's harder, but I think like that is fascinating. You look at, you know, I think an Amazon is trying to protect itself from all the negative, you know, backlash around um, the carbon impacts of shipping and all of that, but them really putting that out there and making it such a, an important piece of the marketing story of products sold um, is something that we're, we're so focused on. We need to get that on all, all of our lists. Like, what does it take to do that? Because that's going to start making the difference in the consumer's minds of people that are putting it in your cart and then subscribe and save. And that's the, the product you choose for the next six to 12 months. Right. Yeah. And I think that, that, that shift to online retailers are getting bolder about doing that because, you know, Amazon, you're right. Climate pledge is front and center there. But even if you look at, you know, Ahol Delhi's their U S uh, online e-com currently, they've now started putting a whole bunch of different little attributes, whether it's climate friendly or grass fed. Uh, so I think we'll see more of these um, attributes starting to pop up in association higher up on the page than just the price. So, oh, we don't have nearly enough time for all the good questions y'all are gonna have, but if you want it, I'd get it in the chat quick because not quite first time for serve, but make a good question and get it in there. Um, okay, I think we have most folks coming back now. Um, so let's, uh, there's one question that came up just before the break that was about emphasizing local or regional food systems. Um, you know, there's climate change, there's energy loss in the sort of transportation. Although I will, I will note that transportation is again, like packaging a very small percent usually of the overall carbon footprint um, compared to the growing of the ingredients itself. But I think that is actually a good reason to sort of turn back to the plant-based side of things. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Diego, if you want to speak a bit to, uh, what you're seeing in plant-based, the future of plant-based, how it connects to that question about, you know, regional local food systems would be, would be great. Yeah. Um, happy to do so. Uh, you know, as one of the things that we do here is, is, is enable our global partners. So, I'm going to go very specific uh, to, to Latin America in, the, in this example. So we have teams that are developing um, and trying to launch plant-based uh, food products uh, behind our One Planet, One Health, um, you know, uh, stance and, and, and motto. And one of the things that, that we started with is, you know, there's these products that we have in the U.S. Should we export? Can we make them locally? And so once we get to the point of, you know, let's make them locally. We start thinking about, let's just essentially make the same product, maybe with some tweaks to make it specific to the customer and, and the palates and, and what's expected. But being plant-based, there's a lot of things that just are locally grown, right? And so go to Mexico, go to Brazil. Um, they're making coconut, they, they, you know, they're growing coconuts. A lot of the, the, the product that, that we're using today may not be from there. And they might say, well, if we want the same product, then we should be getting the same type of coconut supply. But 
being able to maximize the the ecosystem, both from an agricultural standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from just the, you know, landscape of the financial landscape of it all within that community, it makes sense to find those ingredients that make sense to bring into the product. So instead of using a coconut cream that's maybe made in Asia Pacific or growing in Asia Pacific, should we be thinking about uh, coconuts from Brazil and coconuts from Mexico? Um, and our teams do a wonderful job in just exploring what's available locally. Yeah. So I think that's the type of conversation that needs to happen when, when you're thinking about where you're making your product and where is it going to. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this really gets to that idea of product innovation ecosystems, but then also Danone's you know, recent refocus on its local first. And that was said from a business standpoint, but you're now taking it and putting it into a both ecological and a product standpoint. Um, and for thousands of years on earth, food was always local first, um, spiced with wonderful things from other places. So I think it's really cool to hear that even a company the scale of Danone is thinking about how might we do that from a climate perspective as well and from an innovation perspective. It's really, really exciting. There's a question here from Carrie um, that anyone can hop in on um, that's basically about in working towards regenerative agriculture, local agriculture, are, are your companies seeking out farmers that are already going that way or are you um, seeking to help farmers transition in that direction? Um, yeah, curious to hear thoughts from anyone on that. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk about this one a little bit. So um, the the Nam Ham coconut um, market is super interesting, actually. So when when um, I keep joking that we could do like a fascinating documentary about it because it's it's got so much um, intrigue and drama. But um, what's really interesting is that um, organic coconuts are not really sold at a premium. It's very different than many other um, um, crops, and so. You know, when Harmless Harvest started, you know, more than 10 years ago, like we we really built and developed the organic market there. There was there really wasn't such a thing. Um, and in fact, um, given the the impact of climate change, you know, if since they're not getting a premium to farm organically, like many farmers want to use um, chemicals and pesticides that will help them with yield. I mean, this is their livelihood. Um, so they're not super incentivized. Um, so we've spent a lot of time kind of getting that far and now taking the next step to regenerative is like a whole other world. So, you know, we, we've actually, um, we're, we're absolutely leading the charge there. This is not something that farmers are doing on their own, um, which is why we have um, this pilot program. So we have about a dozen farmers. I mean, what we need to do there is actually prove why this is going to be beneficial to the farmer. Um, and only then will we sell that to the rest of the farmers. So, um, you know, I think I, I think it's it is a, an interesting case study um, because we we 100% believe um, that this will improve their livelihoods, um, but we're going to have to prove it. Excellent, excellent. Um, uh, gosh, there's so many good questions here. Uh, one, more, I'm going to do. Sorry, go ahead. No, just to say, just to add one other piece piece to that. Um, like sort of the regenerative journey, I would say we've done a, a bit of both. And I think um, there are certain cases, I think also the rock certification in the US is another hot topic that is confusing. And I think <clears throat> a decision that we made as a team, but in conjunction with Rodale Institute, because we've been partnering with them um, from the start is we talk about our project product as being organic and regenerative, um, trying to create a little bit of dif differentiation, but you know, the rock cert itself, which we have a couple partners that are are there now for, I believe it's our butter and squash, others that are not, when we will be able to actually put that on pack, this is also a bit of the journey. And so we have with our partners, obviously we are committing more than a year in advance to a certain pricing for the regeneratively grown fruit and veg. We also have a $40,000 farmer's fund that last year was focused on um, soil health. This year is focused on agroforestry, but I would say that's how we sort of are partnering, whether it's them, they are interested in the practices or we're sort of sharing, this is the impact. Um, and this is how it could fit into one of our product lines or that we could purchase. Um, but I do think the whole rock certification is a whole nother conundrum of, you know, we on pack already have USDA organic, um, you know, 
organic is non-GMO and then adding a rock, which has three different colors, depending on if you're gold, silver, or bronze. My God, like talk about <laughs> con consumer confusion and what you can fit on front of pack. Right. So. Amazing. Okay. Sorry, sorry. I do want to, I do want to say one more thing that I totally missed earlier that it would have been a really good point when you asked about our interaction with Danone and it's, a, it's, it's a huge miss on my part. So I'm, I'm adding it now. Um, one thing that we did partner with the Danone Ecosystem Fund on is this regenerative project. We got a grant from them, which I think speaks volumes um, to the work that Danone is doing and the um, the interest that they have in in implementing um, these types of practices. So, you know, for a smaller, uh, less profitable company like ours, um, being part of that ecosystem is critical. Sorry. So, uh, no, that's great. Thank you for adding that in. So, let's have uh, like twenty to thirty seconds from each each of you a final thought to wrap us up. There's lots of great questions. It's clear we need more time. Maybe we'll have you all back again sometime. Um, but yeah, just a, a kind of closing out thought. Something you'd like to leave the audience with in terms of innovation, uh, product innovation out there. So let's go, Diego, um, Heather, and then Emmy, Gina. Uh, sure, so I think, for, for, think about design early on, right? Think about the decisions that you're making uh, based on what's available to you, but thinking about what the long-term effect of those, those decisions are. Designing from not only the formulation, but where you make the product, and how you make the product. Awesome. I think that's that's critical um, in, in being able to, to truly change the way we think about you know food systems. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think just something that I was thinking about as we were talking is just this, you know, this consumer first lens that I'm sure everyone on this phone uses and just where the consumer is in this journey. Um, and, and, you know, what our responsibility is um, as, as companies who are leading the charge as we design products to, you know, make the right decisions and kind of, you know, lead where we need to, um, you know, in a way that we didn't need to do maybe five years ago, or maybe it was about organic then and, and now it's about something else is a really important part of what we're all doing. Thank you. Regina? Um, yeah, and then maybe just in terms of how we innovate and how we aspire to innovate, we use the word agility a lot. I think agile is a big Danone buzzword. Um, and I think we talk about that a lot at Happy Family and how we are cross-functional, truly across all functions. You know, we, we allow decisions to be made in a weekly meeting without having to like elevate, you know, up the chain um, and really allowing that space. You know, we're not software companies that use agile, but we create the space for um, prototyping, tasting, taste it with babies and toddlers, sprint, look at costing. Okay, like repeat. Um, and, and just really trying to practice that more and not just talk sort of talking about agile, but like what does it actually take to do that um, in all of our you know, timelines. Excellent. Agile design, product innovation, ecosystems towards regeneration. Thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, you're welcome to check out the recording and please come back for the upcoming uh, talks in the innovation online series. Thanks Heather, Regina, and Diego. See you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye.